uh, just by creating change in the world. And I, I would offer for your entrepreneurs um, who are listening, there's two kinds of entrepreneurs. There's, I'm going to call them, actually maybe three kinds, we'll, we'll go with three. There's entrepreneurs. They think they should be an entrepreneur because it's cool, uh, but they don't have it in them, right? And you're sort of like, well, this is what all the cool kids are doing. I'm going to do it, but I don't feel like the deep drive to do it. You probably should be helping an entrepreneur. So you're entrepreneurial, but you're not actually cut out for that. And, and there's no, like, there's nothing good or bad. In fact, being an entrepreneur is kind of a painful thing, <laughs> to be honest. You have to be willing to self-flagellate sometimes. But then there's there's two other kinds. The next person who has the ability to, you know, build and run a company, but they don't have the creative visionary side of things. And what they're going to do is they're going to become a parasite entrepreneur and they're going to find someone else's idea and they're going to cheapen it and copy it and then put it on the market and say, I'm going to make money. And you're not improving the world that way. And that's the behavior. That's why if you go to Amazon today, it's like going to a swap meet 20 years ago. It's like everything is made out of cheap plastic. And it's always about how can I have the cheapest crap that falls apart in six months after I buy it. And it's frustrating. But if you're the other kind, the kind says, I'm going to do something better or different than has ever been done before. Um, then you actually improve and you evolve the world. And I'd say, look, it's the same amount of work to do either one, except not really. It's less work to do the thing that changes the world because then you're constantly motivated and, and it pulls you. But if you're saying, I'm going to, you know, knock off this other thing I saw and I think I can, you know, replace the metal with some cheap plastic and, you know, put in low quality ingredients and swap out collagen for milk protein isolate because it's cheap and just not even care. And just be like, yeah, I'm just going to build a brand. That's what big food did. It's like, oh, here's how we think. How cheap is it? How good can we make it taste? And can we put a pretty sticker on it? If so, it's a product. And that has led to low testosterone, obesity, um, all sorts of health problems. 42% of people are fat. We don't want to build that world. And you're going to build a world as an entrepreneur. So build the world you want instead of a cheap, shitty world. And if, if we could just get more entrepreneurs on that path, we'll make all kinds of cool stuff that no big company will ever make. And then we'll become big companies. And I learned that in Silicon Valley. Yeah, those are, those are great explanation of sort of the three archetypes and, and certainly hopefully it will inspire people to, to push more on the innovative side. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested since you mentioned, uh, you know, entre uh, different types of entrepreneurs, um, you know, in, in your sort of journey to becoming uh, from the Bulletproof executive, the blog writer to the CEO and founder of Bulletproof, um, I'm curious if you had any particular role models. Um, whether, you know, in your personal life, family life, or uh, role models as entrepreneurs that kind of inspired you to kind of, you know, go to the next level and obviously, you know, run a very large company, manage a lot of people and, and be, you know, uh, the, a very public entrepreneur. Hmm. That's a really good question. I, coming up in, in Silicon Valley, a lot of people, you, know, you don't see a lot of what happens there. It, it's an insular community, um, but it's very competitive. It, it's you know, one of the highest performing places on the planet when you're talking about you know, building these companies. So a lot of the things that I learned, people say, oh, wow, you just you came out of nowhere and you were instantly successful. Like, no, I spent almost 20 years uh, working at these startups, uh, you know, pushing the broom, uh, doing uh, you know, doing my best, but learning uh, from executives, some of whom I greatly respected and some of whom I'm like, I don't want to be that kind of executive. And so a lot of how I learned to do what I do came from, from those experiences. And uh, um, I'm just, I'm thinking back. Um, like I, I worked for a company called uh, Netscaler that was acquired by Citrix for on hundreds of millions of dollars. The, the CEO there, uh, BV Jagdish, was uh, uh, this profoundly amazing guy. And he did yoga every morning for 30 something years. And he was just always calm, um, always fair, and always kind. And that was almost the opposite of what you've seen in a lot of Silicon Valley companies, where you'd see, um, you see like this kind of arrogant, aggressive uh, sort of thing. And he just, he didn't have to do that to build a successful company. And he was competitive, but it was, it was making things win-win for people. And I, I just remember the difference between that and some of the other execs I worked for who were angry and ego driven and all that. I'm like, I, I want more of that. Uh, and so he was an example of that another guy named Peter Fortenbaugh, um, who made a lot of money at that Exodus company. And to this day runs the boys and girls club in East Palo Alto. <laughs> like he's like, I, I have what I need. I'm going to give back for the rest of my life and is profoundly happy doing it. 
So those are two of the guys in my career that really just stand out as, as like, wow, really admirable. But it was more the energy that they would bring to a team and the calmness and the not panicking and the mission driven part of part of it. So when I worked on building the culture at Bulletproof early, um, I looked for those things. And you know, we have our mission and vision and values about making the world a better place. Uh, and then over time, there's very few entrepreneurs who you know, grow companies to 25 million or something who are profoundly good at running $100 million companies. And I'll tell you, um, that's why I have a CEO working for Bulletproof now. <laughs> I'm chairman and founder, but it is incredibly boring to run a $100 million company. It's terrible. Uh, it's like all spreadsheets and, and stuff. And there are people way better suited for that. They're, it's a different kind of brain than mine. Fair enough. Yeah, and I love, uh, by the way, in the examples that you you gave, you know, you cited a CEO that was not just successful, but health oriented and doing yoga every single morning, uh, you know, was kind, which is not sort of a prototypical CEO trait that you hear, uh, at least uh, according to sort of the Steve Jobsian uh, kind of archetype or stereotype, perhaps, uh, that Silicon Valley gets uh, painted a brush with. Uh, and also sort of very philanthropic slash charitable, right? With the other example that you mentioned. Um, it, it's such an uh, important thing, I think, actually for people to hear these sort of contrarian examples.